Recently, <clears throat> I was asked by a seminary student if he could interview me for a class that he was taking. His assignment being that he was to ask questions of a pastor who had been in the ministry for at least 12 years. And the very first question this young man asked me was, what do you consider to be the greatest pros and, and cons of being a pastor. In other words, you want to know what I felt were the greatest positives and the greatest negatives in pastoral work. Now, as far as negatives are concerned, I told them that the greatest negative in ministry was to see believers disobey God's word. There is nothing more disturbing to a pastor than to see God's children disregard the Bible and make sinful choices in life. But the most positive thing about the ministry, I told this young man, is the privilege of preaching the Word of God. Now, while I mentioned to him that there are many positives in ministry, such as seeing people come to faith in Christ, seeing lives transformed by not only the, the initial gospel reception, but by conformity to God's Word, and then being able to, to impact several generations in a church if you just stick around long enough, those are some wonderful things. However, I told him that I consider the preaching of the Word of God to be the greatest honor and the most important thing that I do. And the reason for this is because in preaching the Word of God, I understand that I am standing as a herald of the King of Heaven. There is nothing more important than that, simply because it is through the preaching of the Word of God that God speaks, and there is nothing more important in life than hearing what God has to say. In his book on preaching, appropriately titled On Preaching by Pastor H.B. Charles, he begins chapter one by asking the most basic of all questions about preaching. He asks this question, what is preaching? What is it? And here's the answer that he gives. He writes, the term Paul used in 2 Timothy 4.2, where he charges Timothy to preach the word, was originally a political term, not a religious one. It referred to the function of a herald. If the king had a message to get out, he couldn't just call a press conference and have all the news media publish or broadcast his remarks. He would dispatch his herald to deliver his message to his people. When the herald Arrived at a city, he would cry out his message in a grave, formal, and authoritative voice. When he spoke, the people did well to listen and to take heed. To ignore the herald's message was to reject the king's authority. And the herald would be careful to proclaim the king's message with clarity and accuracy. To misrepresent the king's message was just as dangerous as rejecting it. Now this morning, you have the opportunity not only to hear a sermon, but you have the opportunity to actually hear a sermon about a sermon. Because this morning, as we return to our study of Acts, Acts chapter 13, we find ourselves in that synagogue in Pisidian Antioch, where Paul has been invited to preach a sermon to the Jewish people and the God-fearing Gentiles. Now, as you recall, the 13th chapter of the book of Acts tells us about Paul and Barnabas and their first missionary journey. Having begun their mission's work on the island of Cyprus, they have now moved northwest across the Mediterranean Sea to the area known then as Asia Minor, known today as Turkey. Initially, going to the town of Perga in a region called Pamphylia, they then travel north across some very rugged mountains to a place called Pisidian Antioch. And it was here, as I said, that Paul and Barnabas went into a Jewish synagogue on the Sabbath, that is Saturday, where they were asked if they had any word of exhortation to give to the brethren. And in response to this invitation to speak, Luke tells us in verse 16 that Paul stood up and began giving the people a sermon. Now, 
While Paul certainly wasn't new at preaching, he's had many years of experience of proclaiming God's word since his conversion. What we read here in Acts 13 is, very, is the very first recorded sermon by the Apostle Paul in Scripture. Later in Acts, Luke will give us a couple more of Paul's sermons, but this is the very first one that is recorded in Scripture. We've already heard Stephen give a sermon. We've already heard Peter give a sermon. Here we hear the Apostle Paul give a sermon. As I told you the last time we studied Acts, this sermon by Paul is divided into three main points or three main parts, and they're easy to identify because whenever the apostle begins a new point, he introduces it by specifically addressing the people that he's talking to. And so the sermon begins in verse 16 with Paul addressing his audience. He says, men of Israel and you who fear God. And then he proceeds to expound his first point, which is this. That God, long ago, God made a promise concerning a coming Messiah. And he fulfilled that promise by sending Jesus Christ. Now, without going into much detail about this first point, since we really did study it in detail several weeks ago, I'm just going to read Paul's opening words of his sermon and then briefly comment on them so you'll be able to better understand the flow of his arguments. And there is an argument here that he's putting forth in this message. It starts at verse 16. It tells us, Paul stood up and motioning with his hand, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he led them out from it. For a period of about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. When he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land as an inheritance, all of which took about 450 years. After these things, he gave them judges until Samuel, Samuel the prophet. Then, he asked, then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. After he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. From the descendants of this man, According to promise, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus. After John had proclaimed before his coming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and while John was completing his course, he kept saying, what do you suppose that I am? I'm not he. But behold, one is coming after me, the sandals of whose feet I'm not worthy to untie. Now, Paul's purpose in giving this overview, this review of Israel's history, is to just, just to highlight how good and kind and, and benevolent and gracious God has been to the Jewish people, to the nation of Israel. In every event mentioned by Paul, he speaks of God doing something favorable, something beneficial for the people. So he says he sovereignly chose them to be his covenant people. He just chose them. He increased their population and made them a great nation while they dwelt in another nation, the nation of Egypt. And then he delivered that, that entire nation. It's never been heard of. He delivered that entire nation by leading them out of Egypt. He, picked, he put up with all of their rebellion, all of their murmuring and complaining for 40 years as they wandered in the wilderness. He then brought them to the promised land of Canaan and distributed the land there amongst the 12 tribes. He, he gave them judges, and then he gave them kings to rule over them. And it was through one of these kings, David, that God gave them the greatest blessing of all. He promised them that one of David's descendants would come someday and be the Messiah. And that promise made many years ago, Paul says, has now been Fulfilled. It's happened because this promised Messiah, this offspring of King David has come and God has fulfilled his promise by bringing to Israel a savior and that savior is Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. And his arrival, he says, was even announced by a prophet that they were all familiar with, John the Baptist, who not only declared Jesus to be the Messiah by denying that he, John, was the Messiah, but he also pointed others to the absolute supremacy of Jesus over himself by declaring that Jesus was so great, Jesus was so exalted, 
that he, John, wasn't even fit to do the lowly task that's reserved for a slave of untying the sandals of Christ's feet. Now listen closely. The primary point that Paul is making in this opening section of his sermon is that God has been so gracious, so kind to Israel, and the greatest expression of his grace and kindness is that he promised them a savior and he has fulfilled that promise by sending them Jesus Christ to be their savior. And folks, God has been so kind to us as well. Kind to you, kind to me. Because not only has he sent a savior years ago to Israel, but he has sent you a savior too, even now. Jesus is the only one who can save you from your sins by his substitutionary death on the cross. Because he's the only one qualified to save you since he is the eternal God and he had no sin of his own. His sacrifice was an eternal sacrifice, an infinite sacrifice, because he is the eternal, infinite God. And he had no sin to pay of his own because he's perfect. He is the innocent one. He is the perfect one. The one who Israel should have welcomed with open arms and embraced him as Messiah and Savior, but sadly and tragically, they didn't. Instead, he was rejected by them. He was despised by them. He was crucified and that's something that Paul just has to explain. He has to clarify to the people he's speaking to. Because remember, who, who is Paul speaking to? His audience consists of both Jewish people and Gentile proselytes to Judaism. These are people who were very well aware of the biblical teaching, the Old Testament teaching about the Messiah. And Paul has just told them that their Messiah has come. And he's Jesus, the Savior, the promised one. He's been here. But they know that Jesus was rejected. Jesus was crucified. How could that possibly happen? How could the son of David be treated like that? If he was the true Messiah, then how could he be rejected by the people of Israel and then crucified? Well, that's what Paul is going to explain. This is what he has to explain. Because He's evangelizing them. He's standing before them, witnessing to them. He wants them to accept Christ. And therefore, this has to be explained. He has to remove this, this misunderstanding in their minds about maybe that Jesus isn't the real Messiah because if he was the real Messiah, the people would have accepted him. He's got to deal with that. And he does deal with it. He explains Christ's rejection by the Jewish people and his crucifixion in the next and the second point of his sermon, which is, and now we're going to move on to new material, which is this, that in spite of Jesus being rejected, he, Christ, fulfilled the prophecies made about him in his rejection, in his death, in his resurrection. Starting with verse 26, we read these words. Brethren, son of Abraham's family, and those among you who fear God, to us the message of this salvation has been sent. Now, pausing to address the congregation intimately, he calls them brethren. Why? Because Paul is Jewish, and they are Paul's fellow Jews. They are his brethren according to the flesh. He calls them sons of Abraham's family, as well as Gentiles who believe in the God of Abraham. He refers to them as those among you who fear God. He tells them that the message of salvation in Jesus has been sent out, and he says it's been sent out to us. And by us, Paul means it's been proclaimed to Israel. It's been proclaimed to the Jewish people. God sent the gospel message first to the Jewish people before sending the message to the Gentiles. We know that. And the Jewish people heard the gospel proclaimed many times from many sources. John the Baptist proclaimed it, proclaimed the, the gospel when he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus, for three years, proclaimed salvation in himself to Israel. Come unto me all who are weary and heavy laden and I'll give you rest. He wasn't talking about physical rest, talking about spiritual rest. And the 12 apostles proclaim the gospel to Israel. But with all of those witnesses preaching about Christ and the salvation that he offers, the sad reality 
is that Christ was rejected and crucified by the Jewish people. And now Paul is going to explain why. Verse 27. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, recognizing neither him nor the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled these by condemning him. This is profound truth. Paul explains the rejection of Jesus by the people of Jerusalem and their leaders, meaning what? Meaning the Sanhedrin, the high council. He explains the rejection of Christ by saying that they didn't recognize him as the Messiah because they didn't recognize the utterances of their own prophets who predicted his coming. In other words, they rejected him because they didn't reject They didn't recognize, rather, who he was, and they didn't recognize who he was because they didn't recognize the Old Testament prophecies concerning him. And the amazing thing about this, their lack of recognizing these prophecies, Paul says, is that they're read every Sabbath day in the synagogues. That is to say that these people constantly, constantly heard the many messianic prophecies found in the Old Testament when they attended synagogue services. Every Saturday, they were in the synagogue, and yet, Paul says, they didn't understand these prophecies. They were ignorant of them. They certainly didn't recognize that they were about Jesus of Nazareth. Now, let's stop here, and let's think about this. How could the Jewish people of our Lord's day, who were very familiar with the Old Testament scriptures, that's not true today of of most Jewish people. They really don't know their, their Bibles. But back then, they were familiar with the Scriptures. How could they possibly have missed all of those prophecies concerning Jesus? They certainly knew these prophecies. They grew up hearing about them. They were reminded of them every Saturday when they went to synagogue. In fact, as you'll recall, at the time of Christ's birth, when Herod asked the chief priests and the scribes, he said, where, where's the Messiah to be born without any hesitation? They said in Bethlehem of Judea, for that is what has been written by the prophet. And then they proceeded to quote the prophet Micah. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. So they, they certainly were aware of this prophecy and many others concerning the Messiah. So... If Jesus really is the Messiah, and the Jewish people of his day knew about the prophecies concerning the Messiah, why? Why didn't they accept him as their Messiah? Why did they reject him like they did? That is a major question, and it's a very relevant one still today. It's being asked today. In fact, I remember my own mother years ago putting this question to me this particular way. She said something like this. This was the gist of it. If Jesus was the Messiah, then why haven't our rabbis accepted him? That's what she asked me. See, and what she was really saying is is that ordinary Jewish people like me, like her, look to our learned rabbis who are highly educated and very scholarly. They're, They're scholarly men. We look to them to tell us the truth about God and the Messiah, but if they, being so intelligent, so educated, if they rejected Jesus, then they must have had a good reason for rejecting him, because they concluded that he's not the Messiah. And if they, being that smart, concluded he's not the Messiah, then who am I, an ordinary Jewish woman, to think otherwise? But what my mom and many others have failed to understand is that recognizing or rejecting Jesus isn't a matter of intelligence or education or scholarship. You see, the reason that the Jewish scholars of our Lord's day rejected him, even though they they were aware of the prophecies about him, was because of their sin-hardened hearts. Hearts and minds that willfully refused to acknowledge the truth because they didn't want to acknowledge the truth, and they didn't want to acknowledge the truth because they were comfortable in their sin and were unwilling to forsake the way they were living and have Christ rule over them. This is precisely the truth that Stephen, the first Christian martyr, made in his speech before the Sanhedrin back in Acts chapter 7. He said in verses 51 and 52, You men who are stiff-necked, 
and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You're doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. Jesus said the same thing about the Jewish religious leaders of his day. He said in John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40, he said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me, and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. These men, Jesus said, diligently search the Bible, hoping to find in their search eternal life, and yet they were unwilling to come to him, the one who the scriptures speak of, who could give them eternal life. Unwilling. You see, what was most important to these people were all of their rituals, all of their religious ceremonies, the external trappings of Judaism, rather than following the Lord and the truth from their hearts. In fact, they were quite comfortable in their way of life, which was characterized by performing a series of outward religious duties. It went no further than that. All the while, their hearts were in stubborn rebellion towards God. But Jesus saw their hypocrisy. He saw their evil hearts, and he shook things up because he came preaching against their religious hypocrisy, and he confirmed and condemned their coldness and their loveless hearts, and that's why they were so opposed to him. Our Lord explained it this way in John chapter 3, 19 and 20. He said, this is the judgment that the light, he's the light, has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. See, folks, the reason the people of Jerusalem and their leaders, who, who the people were just following, they rejected Jesus. They condemned him to die is because they loved the darkness of their own evil, and they were unwilling to repent of that evil and start following Christ and his righteous standards. That's the issue. They didn't want true righteousness in their lives. They only wanted to look righteous, to appear righteous, to look spiritual by outward appearances. That's it. But their hearts were in darkness and in defiance towards God. They didn't reject Christ because there wasn't enough biblical evidence to support his claim to be the Messiah. They rejected all of the clear biblical evidence because they loved their sin and they didn't want to turn from their sin and have Messiah rule over them. And perhaps the best illustration of just how hard and dark their hearts were is found in John chapter 11. Let me set the this, this scene for you. John chapter 11 is the chapter which Jesus raises his friend Lazarus from the dead. He, he's been dead for several days, and the Lord actually brings him forth from death, from the tomb. And we, just, we get a glimpse of how hardened the chief priests and the Pharisees were concerning Christ and how determined they were to reject him even in the face of him performing the most remarkable miracle of bringing a dead man back to life. I mean, who ever heard of that? Here's what we read, John chapter 11, verses 45 through 53. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary, that's the sister of Lazarus, and saw what he had done, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. Therefore, the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, what are we to do? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. Now, John adds, now he did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So, from that day on, they planned together to kill him. Now notice, no one said, hey guys, something special has really happened. This man has just raised someone from the dead. 
that's never been done before. Doesn't that prove that he's the Messiah, that he's been sent from God? At least we ought to be thinking about that. No one said that. No one said anything like that. Instead, all that mattered to these men were themselves, maintaining their power, their influence, their control over the people, their place of prominence in their culture and society, their job security. That's all. They weren't interested in the truth. They just focused, they were just focused on their own self-interest, and nothing else mattered. To them, Not even the fact that the Messiah had arrived and proved he was the Messiah by raising a man from the dead. These men were threatened by Jesus and the fear that he would disrupt their secure hold upon the people. And so they decided that he had to be eliminated by being killed. And listen, not content to kill Jesus, they also wanted to destroy all the evidence of his remarkable Miracle, they wanted to kill Lazarus too. We know that because John chapter 12 tells us this, verses 9 through 11. The large crowd of the Jews then learned that he was there, that is, Christ was there. And they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priest planned to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. They wanted to erase all the evidence Kill Christ, kill Lazarus. See, although these men, yes, they were highly intelligent, very educated, their rejection of Jesus lacked intellectual integrity. They didn't care about all the prophecies pointing to Christ. All they cared about was themselves and maintaining the status quo. That's it. That's it. So going back then to Paul's sermon... He says that this is the reason why the Jewish people and their leaders rejected Jesus as the Messiah. They condemned him to die. In spite of hearing the prophecies about Messiah read every Saturday, every Sabbath, they willfully chose to not recognize that these prophecies were about Jesus. That was a choice they made even though he clearly fulfilled them. And as a result of their rejection, they erroneously, tragically condemned him to die as a fraudulent Messiah. But look once again, look once again at Paul's words in verse 27. See what else the apostle says about these messianic prophecies and the Jewish people's rejection of Jesus. Notice the last few words Paul says in verse 27. He said, fulfilled these by condemning him. Now, what he's saying here is that the Jewish people's rejection of Jesus and the Old Testament prophecies concerning him actually fulfilled prophecy. In other words, he's saying it shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone that Israel rejected Jesus because that's exactly what the Bible predicted they would do. Unwittingly, they were fulfilling scripture. So the point Paul is making here is that Israel's rejection of Jesus as the Messiah, far from proving that he's a fake, actually validates and proves he's the true Messiah because how he was treated is exactly how the scriptures predicted the Messiah would be treated when he came. In fact, Paul goes on to say that even the horrific act of crucifying him was a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Notice verses 28 and 29. He says, and though they found no ground for putting him to death, they asked Pilate that he be executed when they had carried out, note this, all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. Paul explains that Christ's murder had nothing to do with him being guilty of any crime. In fact, in John chapter 15, verse 25, Jesus, quoting Psalm 69, verse 4, said these words, they hated me without a cause. Even Pontius Pilate had to admit, he said, I find no guilt in this man. And yet, he was still crucified like a common criminal. And the reason for this is because, as Paul puts it in verse 29, when they had carried out all that was written concerning him, 
They took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. That is to say that Jesus was crucified because it was written by the prophets in the Old Testament scriptures that he would be crucified, which is in and of itself an amazing truth because crucifixion wasn't even a form of execution when many of these prophecies were written. And yet, without using the word crucifixion, the Old Testament very clearly describes the crucifixion that the Messiah would go through and what Jesus experienced on the cross, what he would experience on the cross. For example, Psalm 22 perfectly describes the agonies of one who is being crucified. It was written by King David, but David never experienced anything like this. What he wrote about, he never experienced. That was reserved for Messiah. So, for example, we read in verses 1 and 2, he opens the psalm by saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. My God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I have no rest. This is the cry of one who has been absolutely abandoned and forsaken by God, as Jesus was on the cross, because he bore on the cross the guilt of his people, and the Father turned away from him in judgment. He didn't just feel abandoned. He didn't just feel forsaken. He was abandoned. He was forsaken. We read also in Psalm 22, 16 and 17, for dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. These verses speak of our Lord's hands and feet being pierced as one who had them, who, who had them nailed to the wooden beams on the cross. It also describes the crowds of people who pass by the cross staring at Jesus. We have that song on a hill far away. No, the hill wasn't far away from people. The cross wasn't raised way up. It was along a highway and people came by and they could see very clearly this naked man hanging on a cross. Psalm 22, verse 18, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. This was fulfilled when the Roman soldiers divided Christ's garments among themselves by casting lots for each piece of clothing. In addition, Psalm 69, verse 21, predicted that he would be given vinegar for his thirst while on the cross. That's exactly what happened. Psalm 34, verse 20, predicted that not one of his bones would be broken, and that is exactly the case with Jesus, because instead of breaking the bones of his legs to speed up his death. Instead, he was pierced through with a sword that a Roman soldier thrust into his side. And that was predicted also by Zechariah, the prophet, chapter 12, verse 10. Even some of Christ's last words on the cross, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. That was predicted by Psalm 31, verse 5. Now listen closely. The fact that Jesus was rejected, despised, and then crucified should never be a stumbling block to keep anyone from accepting him as Savior and Messiah, especially the Jewish people. As if Jesus, by his rejection, proved that he was a failure because he just wasn't received, he wasn't, he wasn't crowned as king, as if his mission on earth wasn't successful because he wasn't welcomed as the Messiah. On the contrary, his rejection crucifixion by the Jewish people are what authenticates him as the Messiah. Because this is what the prophets said would happen when Messiah came the first time. Remember the great prophetic words from Isaiah chapter 53, clearly predicting Christ's rejection and his death. Isaiah 53, 1 through 6 Isaiah says, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. 
All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Isaiah is predicting that the Jewish people's reaction to Jesus would be he is a fake, he is a liar, he must go to the cross and pay for his crime. But Isaiah is predicting that they will eventually see the truth, that it was for our sins he was smitten, for our iniquities he was punished. But you know what? Christ's death isn't the only way to verify that he's the Messiah. It's one way. It's a critical, important way. And I say that because after he was crucified and then buried in a tomb, as Paul mentions in verse 29, God vindicated Jesus by raising him from the dead. And that's exactly what the apostle proceeds to speak about next in his sermon, about the resurrection. Verses 30 and 31. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, the very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. Paul says that though men killed Jesus, God raised him from the dead. And I want you to know, the resurrection of Christ is the greatest of all the evidences that Jesus Christ is exactly who he claimed to be. And I say that because later in Romans chapter 1, verse 4, the apostle Paul will write that Jesus, and I quote, was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead. He was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead. See, it is the, it is the physical resurrection from the dead that most loudly and clearly declares that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But listen, if Jesus rose from the dead and nobody saw him, then this loud declaration of his deity wouldn't be heard by anybody. That wasn't the case, though, because as Paul says in verse 31, for many days Jesus appeared to his disciples. And what he means by this is the apostles. And they are the ones who now testify to everyone that he is alive, having been raised from the dead. And it wasn't only the few apostles who saw Christ alive. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6, Paul says that after Christ's resurrection, he appeared at one time, at one time, he appeared to more than 500 people in Galilee. So the evidence for Christ's resurrection is just overwhelming, and it has tremendous credibility. Over 500 people saw him. And the primary significance, folks, of Christ's resurrection is that it is an integral part of the gospel message of salvation. And Paul wants the people of this synagogue in Pisidian Antioch to understand that the reason he and Barnabas have come to their city is to proclaim the gospel to them. And so he proceeds to say in verse 32, and we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers. Now the good news that Paul is speaking about is the promise made to the ancestors of these Jewish people, and that promise is that God would bring them peace and salvation through the Messiah. He promised to send them a deliverer who would forgive their sins and bring them peace, both spiritual peace and then eventually physical peace. And this promise of the Messiah as their deliverer, their savior, is revealed in the many Old Testament messianic prophecies, and that includes truths about his resurrection as well as his death. See, Paul has just told them about Christ's death being the fulfillment of prophecy, but now in his closing argument, he's going to tell them about some of the Old Testament prophecies concerning the resurrection of Christ that were fulfilled by Jesus, verses 33 through 37. He says that God has fulfilled this promise to our children and that he raised up Jesus as it is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As for the fact that he raised him up from the dead no longer to return to decay, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore he also says in another Psalm, You'll not, you will not allow your holy one to undergo decay. For David after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation fell asleep and was laid among his fathers and underwent decay. But he whom God raised did not undergo decay. Now in these verses, Paul speaks of three Old Testament passages that refer to the resurrection of the Messiah. First one is found in Psalm 
2, verse 7. You are my son, today I have begotten you. Now, by these words, neither Psalm 2 nor the Apostle Paul are saying that Jesus became the Son of God at his resurrection. It's not what Paul is saying. It's not what Psalm 2 is saying. He was always the Son of God. He didn't become the Son of God. He was always the Son of God. You see, Psalm 2 is about God defeating his enemies by his king, the Messiah, and then exalting his Messiah as ruler over all the nations of the earth. This hasn't happened yet. It will. But Psalm 2, verses 1 through 6, set the scene for us and the stage for us of verse 7. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he'll speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion my holy mountain. This is a reference to what will happen at the end of the tribulation period when Christ returns, defeats the rebellious nations of the world, and sets up his kingdom on earth. But it is the installation of the Messiah as king that the psalmist then writes about in verse 7 when he says, you are my son today, the day that I, I have exalted you, the day that you have defeated your enemies, today I have begotten you. In other words, he's using the word begotten as a synonym for exaltation. You are my son. Today I have exalted you. Today I have enthroned you and given you rulership over the nations. And although this verse really isn't a direct statement about the resurrection of Christ, it certainly includes it. It has to include it because you can't have an exalted Messiah enthroned upon Mount Zion unless he has been raised from the dead. The prophecy said he would die. He has to be raised to be exalted. A dead Messiah can't rule anybody, but a resurrected one can, and he will. The second and third Old Testament passages that Paul says refers to the resurrection of the Messiah are Isaiah 50. 5, 3, and then Psalm 16 speaks of this. And Paul puts these two passages together because they both are connected to one person, to King David, and the fact that God promised that one of David's descendants would not only be the Messiah, but that the Messiah's body would never decay, never corrupt in the earth because it will be resurrected before decay can set in. So, Isaiah 55, 3, in that Verse, God speaks of giving to the Messiah the holy and sure blessings of David, which is simply an affirmation of the promise made to David that one of his descendants would be the Messiah. And one of those blessings that God promised David's descendant is that his body would never experience decay. And he made that promise in another Old Testament passage, Psalm 16, where we read, you will not allow your holy one to undergo decay. And then Paul explains, he says, this promise can't possibly refer to David because David died. Years ago, David died, and his body did undergo decay. In fact, I want to say, if you, if you go to Israel today, and many of you have been to Israel, you know that there is a building there that your tour guide will take you to, known as the, the tomb of of David. Today, it is housed right below what we believe to be the upper room. The upper room is right above it. It's actually housed in a uh, synagogue. But there, that building is called the Tomb of David, and it houses a coffin in which the remains of David are supposedly inside. Now, it, it is very questionable whether those are David's remains. I'm not opening it up to find out, nor is anybody. <laughs> but listen, his remains are somewhere, if not there, because he did die, and he did not rise from the dead. When David died, his spirit, his soul is with Christ, but, but not David's body. That awaits the resurrection. However, this isn't true of Jesus. As Paul says in verse 37, he whom God raised, meaning Christ, did not undergo decay. Now, folks, don't miss the point that Paul is making in presenting Christ's rejection, his crucifixion, his resurrection. He's explaining that all of this was predicted 
by the scriptures. And the only reason that the, the people of Christ's day didn't respond the way they should have by warmly embracing him is because they willfully refused to see the truth about him. And they were responsible, even though the scriptures predicted this. They were responsible. God holds them responsible because they loved their sin and they refused to repent. They didn't want to change a thing about the way they were living. We face the same danger today. There is a great danger of hearing the word of God, coming to a church like Lakeside and hearing it preached every Sunday, and yet not responding to the truths of repent and turn to Christ and give him your life and trust him to be your savior and Lord. There is that great danger of not responding because you love your sin. You don't want to follow Christ. You don't want to forsake your sin. You're very comfortable in your sin. You don't want his righteousness. If that is your thinking, then be warned. Be warned because there is coming a day when you will deeply regret not turning to Christ for salvation. And that day will be the day that God judges you for your sin. And that day is coming. So repent. Turn to Christ. Trust him before it's too late. See, you can escape this eternal judgment. You escape it by turning to Christ now, trusting him for salvation, because while on the cross, Jesus was judged on behalf of sinners just like you. But you need to respond to him by personally trusting him for salvation. And don't think, well, I have all the time in the world. Then, then at the end of my life, then I'll trust him. You don't know how much time you have. And you don't know that you're going to have the opportunity at the end of your life to trust Christ. And don't let your heart deceive you to think, oh, then I'll be more inclined. No, Scripture says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart, but turn to him. Now, if you are already a believer in Christ, then praise God for the fact that Christ has died for all of your sins. Not some, all of your sins, and that he really did rise from the dead so that you are assured of your salvation because he is your savior. Yes, he came to Israel and offered them salvation and most said no, but he offers us salvation and praise God when we say yes, he is our savior forever. I'm gonna close in prayer in a moment and then Joel will come to close us in, in song, but I want you to know if you'd like to speak to one of our elders about your soul's need for Christ, some of them will be up here at the front of the auditorium when we close the service. But join me now in prayer. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you that it speaks to our hearts, Lord. You speak through your word and through your messenger who delivers the word. And I pray, that, Lord, that if there be some here who fall in the same line of thinking as the Jewish people did, as the council did years ago, that they just like the status quo. They like the way their life is going. I pray that you would shake things up. I pray that you would show them the wickedness of their own hearts. I pray that you will show them the, the eternal significance of coming to faith in Christ, and you would draw them to yourself, Lord. And I pray, Lord, for those who already do know you, that you'll strengthen them in their faith, that perhaps some have doubts and have wondered why the Jewish people rejected Jesus if he was uh, the truth. I pray that today's message might strengthen them and they would realize it's not a matter of intelligence or scholarship, it's a matter of the heart. And so I pray you'll strengthen believers. And I pray, Lord, for those of us who know you, on behalf of them we give you thanks, Lord Jesus, for dying for our sins and for being raised again to assure us that the Father has accepted your sacrifice on our behalf and that we indeed are forgiven. Lord, thank you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.